Let me know when you're ready there. In three, you're ready. Two, one. Live from the Figgis Studios, it is Weekend Geek Update. Smurf here, along with the legend of Colorado, <laughs> the man from out south of Sedalia. <laughs> he is a legend among, well, artists everywhere. And we're going to get into the spaghetti western art that he's doing for one of the best series on Disney Plus today. I, of course, am talking about Monty Michael Moore. Is Mike, I mean, you, I've always known you just as Monty. I mean, all the years we have hung out, it's always just been Monty. Yeah. So I'm did you throw Monty. Michael in there just to kind of like, you know, mix it up a bit? No, because the M3 is good branding. The M3 is good branding. Right. And then I, you know, I have my hashtag, expect more. So people do, oh. you know, their role. That. So, you know, I, I use the name to the benefit. But yeah, every, anybody who knows me, it's just, just it's Monty. It's just Monty. I mean, they, they get confused when I do shows in Europe because that's like <laughs> calling somebody Mountain because that's what it means. And so they always call me Michael because that would be weird to say, hi, Mr. Mountain. <laughs> well, you are a mountain. I mean, let, let's let's be honest. It's a little mountain. It is a little mountain. It's a, it's a molehill. No, it's, it's a mountain. Monte Cristo, Monte Vista. Because <laughs> let's see, we started, because you did uh, Majesticon. I, I bought what was the Denver Comic Con right. from Wayne at Time Warp. Yep. And he had another partner, Steve, and they didn't want to do Steve who passed away. I, I think did. it was Steve that passed away. I think I might have heard that. Yeah. Um, so I bought it. I renamed it. We held somewhere between 14, I think it was 14 shows in seven years. Yeah. So there was one year where we did four shows and we did you know like every quarter right. and certain vendors liked it and then there was another year it was the year bill sinkevich canceled we only did like one show that year um and so you know back then believe it or not you couldn't get more than about 400 people no to show up i didn't care if you had bernie wrightson joe jusco you Dave had Dorman. stan lee for <laughs> fuck's sake you had stan lee i paid 20 dollars to get a stan lee signature on my spidey 50 thanks to you no, I think that was when it was the new Denver Comic Con, though. No, no, it was it was out where we did Majesticon. Merson oh, and was, I were there. Then I think it was before I bought it. Oh, okay. Trust me, if I'd had Stan Lee, I'd have known. <laughs> <laughs> I've had Stan Lee. No, okay, so then it wasn't you, but I, I think th that was PM pre -mod, Oh, right? that pre might be. Uh, yep. That might be that. Yep. Yeah, because I can remember uh, artists like Ron Lim, and I think Jim Lee might have been at one of the ones. Jim Lee was there. Um, I remember Ron Lim. Uh, I think that's actually where I got uh, Jusco's signature on that Mary Jane uh, poster. Well, we had when we had Majesticon, we did have Joe out twice. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm as an artist myself. Obviously, I'm an art snob. And so I only brought people in that I really liked and respected. And it was usually more of a painter, right? right? So you had Dan Brereton and Linsner and Jusco and uh, Dave Dorman. You know, we, we had a lot Some of... Some great names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, you've mentioned names that I have... I mean, like Linsner, I haven't even thought of for like ever because I don't... They're not doing covers really any, anymore. And yeah, I don't know... He's doing like Vampirella and stuff for Dynamite. He is doing Dynamite stuff. Yeah. Because you're all over the place. Because even you, being the man about town, and we'll get into like the the illustrious history and my my my, you know, teaser as far as who you're working on. But <laughs> I mean, you you are an accomplished painter by no stretch of the imagination. Don't get me wrong, you are a, an amazing painter. And I remember even I remember one of the cons you had Jen. One of your models. Yeah, boy, you have a good memory. I she did. must have left an impression on you. She. <laughs> <laughs> Not she only was, that, but the print that the, the art that I bought of her. Right. Yes, that left a bigger impression. She but. was a fitness model, very very athletic gal. Yes, <laughs> and she was there with you, and you guys were, were tearing it up. But your your attention to detail and your line work and just how you because I'm on your page right now, so you can go to theartofmontymore.com, and this this banner that you have up here is just. Freaking amazing! That is a, that, a pencil drawing. It's about a 30-inch drawing. And uh, the year that I started doing these kind of stagecoach pieces, All right. I, I won fourth in the world for pencil work uh, in an online competition that was international. And you had to compete every month with oh, new art. Oh, so it's like you just couldn't rest on the laurels. They want what? what no, what it had to be, to be all now. new. Yep. Wow. Okay. And um, and so I I made it to the world finals and I placed fourth overall in the world for pencil drawing for Western art that year. Wow. Uh, and then in eighteen and nineteen for the same competition, I won the People's Choice Award. Because that's not the only awards you've won. Because you've also done like cans for motorcycles. 
Yeah, that well, I probably painted 100 to 200 motorcycles during, I would say, from 2000, probably five to 2020. And most of the motorcycles I painted, they won every single show here in Colorado uh, for best paint, best art, best use of color. And then, you know, international, well, not international, but national shows like um, the, the Vegas Bike Fest won twice out there. And then one year up at Sturgis, they, in 08, there was a competition just for art and motorcycles. Right. Like they didn't judge the rest of the bike. And so I, I won that one as well, the best art that year. And you know, most of the motor, uh, almost in all the motorcycle magazines. Right. Cause I was trying to raise the quality and the bar on right. custom motorcycle paint. And because of all the OCC and West Coast choppers, it was a really good market for a while. Well, and I can believe that. So were you doing, like, stencils? Were you doing freehand? Or how were you? Stencil. Come I, on. I, You're the, killing me, Smalls. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you trace it. Really good. We're, not, we're not doing Greg Land stuff, okay? We won't, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes if you're doing logos and stuff, you do have to get them exact. So I did the motorcycle for Rusty Wallace when he retired. Oh, okay. And it was called Rusty's Last Call. And so it was all, you know, sponsorship with Miller and all that kind of thing. So um, I think even a lot of the NASCAR people had to approve some of the bikes that I did because one of them was for a Speedway and... You know, I mean, they were asking a hundred grand for you know these motorcycles. Holy crap! Oh yeah, and this was quite a while back, and there were some bikes that I painted that you know builders were offering for you know seventy to hundred thousand. Did you work with Orange County at all? I mean, I know the, the um, Paul Senior and Junior actually have been to Colorado a number of times. Mm -hmm. they, they've worked within in the town a lot. Uh, I've never worked with them more than they bid on a bike that uh, a the number one Star Wars collector in the world who had bought. Uh, several paintings from me and owns, right. and owns two motorcycles that I had painted. He wanted to do a, a Star Wars bike that I designed. Is this the guy that has a huge like silo like in the middle of nowhere? Or I, I mean, they, they've always like show him on like Star Wars shows no, and this, all that. This guy is the guy under the radar that nobody knows about. Oh, um, even better. So, yeah, incognito. Yeah, so <laughs> he. Um, you know, I can't get into no, 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 details I understand. on his you got, collection. You got, you got to keep, yeah, keep um, that quiet. But, but, any, but anyway, he wanted a custom motorcycle, and he wanted it to have a jet engine, like like the one that Leno had that literally had a turbine, a jet yeah. turbine. And so he, we had a guy in Fort Collins bid on it, a guy in Texas and OCC. And they were all like, yeah, it's going to be 100000 120000 Wow. What did it finally go for? Can you... uh, he didn't end up building it. Oh. So, but I had some cool-ass drawings. I can imagine, I mean, just to see, like, a turbine underneath, you know, oh, yeah. a, a, the frame of a well, motorcycle. Well, so we looked into it, and he was we was going to pull a, a turbine off of an old Huey, old military helicopter. Oh. And he was working on some of the engineering and things. But, like, the tank was Slave 1, and the rear fender was a Superstar Destroyer that sat over the rear wheel. <sighs> And lightsabers and bantha sticks for forks. I mean, it was. It was that off. is intricate. It was off the hook. Oh I, have, my I have some cool God. <laughs> I can only imagine how much it would have cost, to like, like you say, a hundred grand to like build the damn thing, and then selling it. Oh my God, that would have just been. I want to write it though, just, <laughs> right. just, just, just to see like Batman style, you know? Yeah, pretty much. Do you have a medium that you like doing? Because I know you do art, you do sculpting, you do. I mean, you do anything that is of a creative nature. What What's your, like, okay, this is what I really like to do? And my two favorite mediums, obviously black and white. Like, I love pencil. I love the simplicity, and it's fast, and it's portable. And you can do it on a plane. You can do it right. on a train. You can do it, you know. It's Just a, all you need it, is a napkin. Yep, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then um, I would say my forte, and what a lot of people know me for, is airbrushing. And it's... I'm so glad that my mom gave me an airbrush when I was like 17, 18 years old. Right. And I really just took to it. And airbrush is like the most abandoned art form of all time. It is. Like, you know, I, I tease people that be an ad in the classifieds and it would say, airbrush used once, thrown twice. You know, because <laughs> the thing is, is if your air is not working and your, and your viscosity of your paint and your needle and all these moving parts and it's not clean, then it's frustrating. You're like, oh my God, my airbrush doesn't work. I can't use it. Right. And so uh, people hate them, absolutely hate them. And it's amazing to me what I've painted with them from 70 foot murals, uh, you know, the murals down at Denver Divers and other ones around town. Right. Denver Divers down where you live. Yep. And um, 
Uh, but even just this morning, I had my airbrush out and I was working on a frame for, for the exact piece of art you're talking about. Okay. And I wanted part of the exterior of the frame, which is a barn wood frame to be just a little darker, a little more brown. Okay. So here I'm airbrushing the wood. I'm adding my own aging. Nice. But then there's going to be two pistols that look absolutely authentic that are cap guns that I bought. And I'm insetting them into the frame. So there's going to be two offset guns in each corner. But then they're also brand new. So I want them to look old. So here I'm taking like a sepia paint and I'm painting over the gun and then I'm lightly taking my hand and I'm scuffing so it looks like it's aged. So it's had a little warmer. There's a little patina on it. And then I, you know, seal that. And it's like if you didn't have the the quick confidence to understand how it's going to work, I can take basically a $25 cap gun right. and make it part of this, you know, piece of art and frame. And it's just such a versatile tool that I, you know, whether I'm creating a piece of art or I'm antiquing something, mm. it's I'm just using it all the time, and I'm like, man, I'm glad I know how to do this. There, <laughs> there's only one artist that I know that actually airbrushes covers, and it's Martine, and he does some amazing original art on blank covers. But he's the only one, and you're the only other mm -hmm. person yeah, I know I've that does dozens of airbrush covers, at yeah. all. Yep. I mean, is it is it really that intricate? Is it that delicate or hard to use? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and the. Um, you know, the, the, there's a needle in the middle of it, and it's like the smallest, sharpest needle you've ever seen. If it's bent or it's, you know, offset Just even or slightly gets, askew? Yeah, then, then you're toast. Oh. And, you know, you have to become an expert on how to straighten it back out. And do you have an extra? And, you know, I can't field strip a gun, but I can field strip an airbrush uh, real quick <laughs> and repair it and, you know, fix it and all that kind of thing. Because, yeah, I mean, when you're on the road, I mean, you have probably one of the most elaborate and comfortable setups <laughs> at a con that I have ever seen. You have couches. <laughs> You got throw pillows. I don't know what con I had seen you at, but I mean, it looked like John Wayne's living room, and I lo I loved it. Oh, that was Cowboy Christmas. Yes. Yes. Oh my God. So that... I have that in two weeks. I, I go we go back. Oh. Yep. And so the uh, artist that I show with at those shows, Ernie Apodaca, builds these amazing Western and Native American themed leather couches mm -hmm. and, and ottomans and easy chairs, and so. We share the booth, and we do uh, two or three shows per year. Right. And he gets the floor, and I get the walls. Right? Wow. And See, that's it, just balance. Yeah. And so uh, he he doesn't have to pay or decorate what would be behind his couches. So it looks more like an upscale, the the living room in Yellowstone. Yes, you know, exactly. it does. I mean, did you watch the season <laughs> premiere? For, oh, God, yeah. Oh, you? my. I've seen it twice. God. <laughs> if you haven't watched the new season of uh, Yellowstone, Oh my God! The first ten minutes will just is like blow your that, mind. Yeah, probably the best ten minutes. Kevin Costner is such a badass. That's all I. Got, that's, <laughs> that's all I got to say. Well, the ladies like Rip, and you know, yes, the, the men like us respect the men in it because they get to knock people's teeth in. They do. And, and they're a little violent. Yeah, there's some. There's absolutely some frontier justice when you're like, well, this guy needs to be disappeared. Like we're not calling the cops. We're it's not, not calling Longmire, the cops. You know, I love Longmire too. Uh, don't get me wrong, but that was you know he's the law where. Uh, yeah. This is like out here is like no no no, no. We, we, this is our own yeah law. I can't see Katie Sackoff taking somebody out but Kevin Costner just showing up with a shotgun <laughs> oh yeah it really reminds me of like Silverado that film oh, yeah. and I just it's so so palatable I love that show <coughs> um, so with your with your art and everything who is your like best Western character that you like this is this is the one that I always love or is there a character in the Western mythos that you're always like. Yeah, this guy's the badass. Um, you know, a couple of my favorite films growing up as a kid, uh, you know, I'd always say Star Wars first. Right. But then I would, for some reason, there was also movies like Big Jake and Rio Bravo in there. And so I was very much a John Wayne fan. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as the new, like newer films, like they're, like you mentioned, Silverado, mm -hmm. Silverado, Tombstone, there's very few newer Westerns that stack up right. to that kind of stuff. And I'm a fan of those. I loved Hell on Wheels as a series. Right. Uh, it was fantastic. And so with what I'm doing with uh, Blood and Bullets is combining a, a background in that I grew up on a 30,000 acre cattle ranch right. in, in Idaho. And every summer, the day after school was out, you left for the ranch, and you didn't get to see your friends for three months. No, right? Exactly. It was literally, and I'm not kidding, you know, it's sun up to sundown, and you're building fence, and you're riding and roping, and all these things that I was not particularly good at, 
nor light because it's darn hard work. It is absolutely hard work. My mother grew up on a ranch in Wyoming. Okay. So, you know, grandpa would have us out. Of course, being smaller at the time, we weren't expected to go right. out and do it. But, I mean, just watching that unfold, it is it is damn impressive and damn hard work. Yeah. We got a dollar an hour, you know, and we, we tracked our hours all summer, and then right. that money would get paid to you. But the parents, and then that money went in your – uh, college account. Oh, you know, okay. That you were, you were, you, you had to work, and you were forced to save it. <laughs> all that hard work, you're right. Nothing. <laughs> it's like getting in. Well, we all went to college, and we all paid for our own college. Wow. So, I mean, I, I went to CSU, where my dad and my brother went. Oh, okay. Yep. yep. Yeah, I mean, that's better than getting like a loan and a scholarship and you know I, any of that nonsense. None of us, uh, all, all of us graduated, and none of us had any debt, which I think is nearly impossible for kids to do today. I yeah, so I don't think for so. $100,000 education. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. I always see the online is that people say, you know, well, you know what you were getting into, and it's like, I was 18 years old, and <laughs> somebody said, hey, we'll give you an education. You want to get 100000 You got legs? Perfect. Sure. So I used to yeah. tease my dad because he said that his, he when he went to CSU in the 50s, that his tuition was 75 bucks and I said dad it's not 75 bucks anymore it's eleven hundred dollars a semester <laughs> and the, yeah the reason why we're, we're laughing is because eleven hundred dollars now now just barely covers the books is yeah it sounds like lunch money to the fact that CSU or CU will cost you between 30 and 40 per year yep and that's insane because my whole college education was like 28 all in you yeah, know <laughs> it's, that's the entire degree right there yeah yep. yeah it's <laughs> so bad uh but i mean with all of the the western stuff there is one of the things and, and then i'm going to transition to star wars because I'm, I'm i'm tiptoeing around that because i'm really <laughs> anxious to talk to you about star wars sure. but the one that you did that i'm absolutely fond of is that you got to work on the nose of of a bomber and you mm -hmm. did a a classic style pinup. What was that mm -hmm. like to? Did you have the whole plane, or is it just the the part front part of the fuselage? It was just the front part, and it was actually a, a more of a fighter plane than okay. a bomber. So it's called an AT six Texan, okay. which is a sort of canary yellow navy. You know, a little bit different than say like a Spitfire or something like that. But, right. Th but they use it primarily as a trainer plane. And then later on in the war, when you know things were dire and people were running low on stuff, they actually did outfit them with guns. Oh wow! Okay. Um, and so this particular one's owned by a customer up in uh, uh, eh, the Decono Firestone kind of area. And it was funny because he saw me at a car show when I was doing the motorcycles right at the very beginning. Right. And he looks at all my work and doesn't say much, and he's like. You ever painted an airplane? <laughs> and I said, no, no, but it's on my bucket list. <laughs> and I have one of my motorcycles. I'm a big motorcycle guy. And I have a 1986 VMAX. Oh, which that's was a nice like ride. The, the street muscle bike mm -hmm. of the 80s. And so mine's painted uh, Department of Defense green. It has the shark teeth. It is full on Very nice. flying tigers, right. right? Bullet holes, pinup girls on the top. So when he saw that and I was like, I have a love of news art and pinup art. My grandfather was in the Navy. He retired as an admiral. And his flying lights was signed by Wilbur Wright. Oh, my God. Very cool family heirloom. Yes. And um, so he's like, all right, I'm going to call you. And I will tell you, and anybody who does shows, 99% of people who say they're going to call you really don't. Right. But two weeks later, he's like, why don't you come up to my house? And so I go up and I see this airplane. And I'm like, okay, working on a quarter million dollar canvas is a little stressful. Right. <laughs> no doubt. And so I had what I just call the donut, which is, you know, the big round part that goes around all the pistons and the right. engine and that sort of thing. So I had that in my garage sandwiched between two desks so I could move around <laughs> it and I could get to it. Because the pinup girl on each side, which uh, also had the name Major Distraction. So that was the name of the plane and the art. So it said that right next to her. And of course, the direction that she's facing, the wind, everything's blowing the skirt Of course, yeah. All that. And so there's a couple of really cool pictures that were taken of it in the air from another plane. Oh, see, I yeah. didn't see that. I saw the, the stills from it being in the hangar and all of that. I didn't know that it was still airworthy. That's even 
Oh, God, yeah. yeah. I went up in it. Oh, my God. Yeah, he took, and I it literally flew over my house because we kind of came down here by Chatfield, right. stuff like that. And so there's a really cool picture that Laura wants to frame and put in our house where you, I'm seeing over the wing, right. and I can see my house down below. And he kind of <laughs> dipped around the neighborhood, and I was like, I really can say, hey, there's my house. There's my house. <laughs> it's like that Allstate commercial. We will not identify other uh, highways or our, our home. homes. <laughs> <laughs> so did you get to, like, take the stick at all? or was no. It, no, okay. <laughs> Thankfully. And, you know, uh, I will say, uh, as much as I have, I have a, a few things that I'm pretty good at and right. strengths. Um, uh, motion sickness is, uh. is one of the things that bothers me. And I, th- this is going to sound funny, but even uh, when I'm wearing, like, the Quest 2 headset, the VR headset, right. like, I can do, like, the Beat Saber games and the fighting games and stuff like that. But uh, the roller coaster game would totally make me lose my lungs. Yeah. Uh, I can't do anything tight and, circles. Yeah. Which and sucks. Uh, rides uh, going to, I got to go to the Art of Disney, which kind of right. leads into what you want to talk, talk about. We're going to talk about, yeah. Um, and people are like, did you go on rides down there? And I'm like, hell no. I'd rather be in the Rainforest <laughs> Cafe than a roller coaster that's going to make me ralph. Oh. Because <laughs> there are some simulators at Disney that are just absolutely, like the Simpsons one at Universal. That right. one is, it is very, it is very motiony. It is very choppy. And there's a lot of, stuff flying at you and you if you've eaten game over i mean that will it will wreck you yeah i remember going to the uh what do they call the big theater x theater thing the real tall ones. yeah the the imax imax thank mm-hmm. you um that uh we i mistakenly went to see flight oh no and i literally had to close my eyes because i was getting air sick i was like this is a little too realistic for me too much <laughs> why am i here why <laughs> what am i doing so you go to disney and were you at galaxy's edge did I you? was in the heart of Galaxy's Edge, oh. right next door to the, the, the depot thing where you get to buy all the cool Galaxy's Edge stuff. Right. And uh, I was a, a, a guest artist for the weekend at the Art of Disney store, doing my first ever on-site signing for Disney. I, you've been working for how – how long have you been working for Disney? I mean, because I know this wasn't your first project with them. Um, so the interesting part is, is uh, so they a lot of the things that I'm doing right now for The Mandalorian – is uh, for Thomas Kincaid Studios, right. who is a licensee that has licenses with DC, Marvel, Disney, and right. Star Wars. So he's got the, the IP licensing and all of right. that stuff. He's, he died in 2012, but the people who now steward his company and his wife is involved and things like that. And so I approached them actually after San Diego Comic-Con, the, the last one we actually had, right. so two years ago, and um, they were there promoting their products and so when I see an opportunity, I will then reach out to them. And again, 90% of the time, you will never hear back from anybody. Nope. And so I sent a total cold email to through the website. And I got oh, a response wow. about a week later saying, you know, the VP of marketing would like to set up a, a call with you. And I was like, what? Because like, I, I mean, I'm used to, I have thick skin because I'm used to getting rejected by everybody. I get rejected by everybody all the time. Yeah. Um, and it's I get, true. I get you, rejected more than I get interviews. <laughs> well, the, it's just part of the business. It is part, part of the business. business. It's not personal. I get you that. You know, people say, why aren't you doing magic art right now? Because I did some magic art like 20 years ago. And I'm like, I guess because the art directors either don't think my style is right, but they don't return my calls or my emails. But I have certainly reached out uh, many, many, many times over the last 15 years. And, you know, if they don't want my artwork, I'm moving on. I, right. You know, I'm you got better busy. things to do. <laughs> That's the way I like to think of it. I have better <laughs> I things, have to, better do. things <laughs> to do. <laughs> this train has left the station, people. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it was too funny. Because I know, what's, which set did you do in Magic? Was it, it wasn't Ice Age. It was Onslaught and Odyssey. That's and right. Classic 7th. Yeah. And they actually keep reusing some of my art in the Commander deck. Right. I think it's Darkwater Catacombs. Do you get any kind of... You get some free cards. Okay. <laughs> but that's about it. And not, you don't even not, play. You not, play. Yeah, no, I don't. I, although I do have unopened, still in the plastic sets from Onslaught and Odyssey. Oh. Exactly. That okay. are sitting in the archives, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, actually, as a side note, for the first time ever, I actually have original magic art back because I sold three paintings to four paintings to a guy almost 20 years ago who right. bought them all, 
and then he decided he wanted to pay off some bills or mortgage or something. Right. And he's like, you know, you want to buy him back? You, I'm gonna. He said, <laughs> I'm gonna offer these for sale. And so one sold out of my budget range, and I bought back the other three. Nice. So what I plan on doing is taking the sketch, the signed card, the original mm, art, make and a nice little package, and making a really nice frame that's everything. Nice. That's nice. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> 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 I got a whole ten dollars for you. Yeah. One, two, three, three more zeros. A couple more zeros behind that. <laughs> Should be good. Original no, art for ten dollars. Oh yeah. <laughs> no. Sign me up on that one. Shit. Yeah. Uh, so you're at Galaxy's Edge. You're in the heart of Galaxy's Edge. Did you get to go on the Falcon? Did you do the tour? I wanted to, and I kind of. I, uh, I wrongly assumed it would be part of like the fact that I was going to have a badge that was like, "Hey, you're a guest of right." I should the be Disney able to go property. wherever. And uh, we, ha I had a between my signings, I had like a morning session and then I had an afternoon. Right. And I was drawing for every customer. I was putting a remark on every. Oh plan. my god. Yeah. So you know, I would spend five or ten minutes on each kind of sale. Right. Um, and. Uh, I, I was I was like, hey, I want to go to Star Wars, and they were like, yeah, you you, you know you got to go online and get a ticket. And I was like, what do you mean I got to get a ticket? Yeah, I'm like Star Wars artist. It's here. I'm like, VIP. Like yeah, they put me up. Yeah, and I didn't have a reservation, oh. and they were all booked up. And it was obviously still COVID. It was like January, right. July. It was pretty hot and muggy down there. Yeah. Um, and so I went back to my hotel room and. Took a nap. You know, it <laughs> drew it. Actually, we we were we had just launched our Kickstarter at the time for Loco Hero Number Two, right. the second graphic novel, and so we were uh, we had only launched it like the day before, so we were busy doing lots of follow up and posting new things. So we just kind of ran that. So how is it to feel? Because I mean, this is like every kid's dream: Star Wars. Oh God, yeah. I mean, this is our generation. I mean, we grew up at the heart. I have a life size Han Solo in carbonite in my studio, and one of my motorcycles is custom painted to look like the hull of a ship. And on one side it has the symbol for the Rebel Alliance, and on the other side it has the Empire. Nice. And then on the <laughs> so where you you've got these awesome exhaust ports on your motorcycle, and you you've basically got a nerd's dream come true. And I hate to say this, but between your legs. And <laughs> <laughs> it is a very fast bike. <laughs> but, I mean, I, I'm, I'm almost just, like, in awe of just how – I mean, you had to be at the right place at the right time. I mean, this is absolute just, like, stroke of luck. Well, and so when we started the, the conversations, obviously, uh, I was – I had already done a fair amount of work for Star Wars for other licensees. Right. So – uh, fellow geeks out there might remember the Star Wars camping chair that looked like R2-D2. Mm -hmm. So that was my design. Um, and that was sold on ThinkGeek. And then uh, the Star Wars video game that was called Star Wars Galaxies was... Uh, I remember that. The one of the very first digital card games where mm -hmm. people could trade digital. So I did assets for that and, and uh, EverQuest and a, and a few other projects when there used to be a Sony studio here in town. Right. Um, uh, Direwolf, which I think they're just now autonomous. It's just not yeah. a Sony, Sony studio. Um, and so when I had reached out to him, I was like, hey, I'd, you know, I'd love to do some Marvel and things like that because I, I've kind of uh, 10 years I was doing a lot of fantasy art and I was doing a lot of motorcycles, but I wasn't doing a lot in comics. But I was writing my own uh, stories that I didn't know I was necessarily going to turn into graphic novels. Right. It's just I had ideas and so I would write just write them down because yep. you were doing films for a little bit yep yep and so in 08 i wrote my first screenplay it was immediately optioned uh, the the production ended up being a disaster and the guy didn't finish i got my rights back um and then since then including the blood and bullets graphic novel which launches on wednesday that screenplay has been optioned i think four times oh wow and so i have the rights back to it as well and i thought I my ultimate goal is for these stories to actually be streaming, you know, feature films and series. And so I thought, well, the best way to market it is leverage my position of my art and art direct and create these things. And if I can use the Kickstarter and Indiegogo platform to have people pre-purchase right. and help fund it, it's a lot easier than, you know, trying to fund the whole thing. Right. So which makes sense. I mean, yeah. that's that's how the world works yeah. now. Yeah. 
And I've been doing a lot of covers. I've probably done 60 to 100 covers for uh, Lady Death since 2014. And so Brian Polito is a very much a, a mentor and somebody that I look to to see what his successes are in rebuilding and his self-publishing empire. Well, he took over Lady Death after, um, what's his name passed away? Well, he's always owned it. It was his oh, okay. creation. Oh, okay. Stephen Hughes Yes, was, Hughes, thank you. Yeah, no, so Lady Death was his creation. He hired uh. Stephen Hughes to do artwork. So they were very good friends. They, they toured the circuit. They promoted stuff. They were the bad boys of comics for quite a while. They were at that. If you ran into them at a con. They were partying. They were partying. It was yeah. a good time. <laughs> yeah. And um, so he started republishing Lady Death in 2014 and is you know, taken from bringing things back in his house to, you know, owning a building and having a dozen employees. And he's the king of Kickstarter. He literally has the top 10 spots right. of the most funded comics Kickstarters in history. All 10 of them are his. And now his campaigns are regularly going over 400K. Wow. Um, and he does four or five That's inspiring, though. Oh, well, yeah. Now he's got a multi-million dollar business. And so my goal is doing some of the same things he does, mm. which is trying to publish on a more regular basis. Right. And so, but also having your project mostly done. So in other words, rather than a lot of um, uh, comics, would be comics publishers or creators, they're like, hey, I've got this idea, I've got a little bit of art, you know, give me some money so I can go try to make it. All right. And what Brian does, and now what I've done with all mine is, I will go make it first and then say, doesn't this sound interesting or would you like to read it or own it? Here's your chance to buy a copy. Right. So you do have to self fund it ahead of time. You got to pay your pencil or your inker if you're using one, your colorist, your letterer, and then be ready to you know pay that bill and the advertising. Hit, so hit the ground running. Yeah, and honestly, without scaring people away, you, you better have five to ten grand to invest in just the art if you want, in my opinion, professional level art. And I don't think that's unreasonable. I actually, no. you know, having been on both sides of this table. And, and even helping Red get her book published and having it fought through multiple artists trying to get other stories done and worked on, five grand is actually a reasonable starting point. I mean, it's right. easily to get... That's probably just... Well, and it depends on the size. If you're doing a regular comic book, it's 22 pages. Yeah. You know, I'm doing 48-page graphic novels, so they're a little bit bigger and thicker. They take, you know, usually a, a year right. to produce. Um but as I, I told you a little bit earlier, you know, I wake up every morning, I might have four or five text messages or uh, messages in Messenger where I'm seeing new pages. And it's coming in from France, Italy, Belgium, right. Brazil. And colorists and everybody else are showing me. And so I'm art directing and starting my day looking at what new pages are coming in. And um, right now I've only had to walk away from two artists of the sort of six or eight that I'm working with right. where they, they, it's a common problem. They just couldn't be timely. So your, your Kickstarter, because uh, Blood and Bullets, I, I've seen, you've already done one Kickstarter on it. Yeah, in, in um, April of this last year, we did a very successful Kickstarter that had over 600 backers and raised about 45,000. It would, I love the preliminary sketches. Everything I saw on that, Absolutely brilliant. I thought it was, it's original, it's creative, and holy hell does it look like it's fun. It's fun. It is fun. And, you know, how can you not have fun with gunfights and vampire bites? I know. Yeah. See, I mean, that was, <laughs> I thought that was like the greatest tagline. I'm like, are you kidding me? And I'm just like <laughs> laughing my ass off about the whole thing. Like, this is, I mean, and I, it's one thing. And you've been on the comic side. We're always mm -hmm. screaming for something original. We want something right. new. Entertain us. And, Hot damn, you got it. I yeah, mean, don't kick the same dead cat. Don't, you know. Yeah, stop stop beating the cat. <laughs> it's dead. Can't get any more dead. Yeah. Unless, of course, you bring in blood and bullets and, you know, gunfights and vampire right. bites. Right. It's great. Well, even my superhero comic has no superhero in it. So, Which is perfect. Yeah, so Loco Hero is about somebody who thinks they're a superhero, but actually lives in our regular world. She's right. homeless, she's a veteran. But in her, in her head, a lot of this stuff takes place where, you know, she can envision herself as a samurai and the street thug she's fighting is, you know, to her looks like a ninja. And so... It's you, very Don Quixote. Yes. It and is. I love that. Yes. Um, and uh, it, it was very well received. And, and people who read the first issue of Blood and Bullets said, 
you know, I like this as much. I'm having a hard time saying which one I like better. And if they are more military or maybe more superhero, they might be like, ah, you know, this was your first one. I'm really a partial to, to this. And there's a few other people who are like, man, I haven't read and enjoyed a good Western in a long time. And it's a Western with a twist because it's right. more like Tombstone meets Underworld in way right and Strong i was going to say like character. rodriguez meets you know lee van cleef or you exactly. know it, it's something you know something very creative something you're not expecting so uh, i'll i'll do a teaser here for a piece of art that's not out yet okay and mike chrome who is one of my absolute favorite cover artists out of australia just talk about a craftsman he right. does really cool stuff. He does. So on the last cover of Local Hero, she looked like she was coming out of the page because in the story, there's comics actually being read and used as part of the plot line. Right. And I was like, man, this is genius. I love this. So he turned in a sketch, a couple different sketches, and I said, you got to do this one. And it's <laughs> and I'm not super huge on homage covers. Right. Where people ask me to do them. But it's basically a, a similar version to the poster for The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Oh. And I have three main characters, and they're all females, but it's going to say The Good, The Bad, and The Deadly. Nice. <laughs> See? I like that. I, I mean, was like, I was like, you gotta, you got to save the original for me. Like, I'm owning that. Yeah, that, one, <laughs> that one's going on the wall. That's a personal one. Yep, and I bought his other covers as well, so... <sighs> And, it, and it's hard to resist. I mean, I've run out of wall space at this point. I don't even know. Because <laughs> i got to take something off to put something up now. And oh, I'm yeah. like, and some rooms don't even have walls right now. So that's even more of a problem. So yeah. I don't even know what to do anymore with art. I, I just, I hung three new pieces in the studio. And I'm like you, I might go years where I change nothing. Yeah. But then uh, sort of circling back a little bit to the art I'm doing for Mandalorian, I had gotten artist copies from them that were really nicely framed. Right. And so... I put up three of the canvas gicle fine art prints oh. in the studio, and I took down the prints of the good, the bad, and the ugly because they're going to Cowboy Christmas in two weeks. And I was like, well, oh, that works out I'll well. I'll put up Mando and Grogu and, you know, speeders and all that kind of stuff. So what did you think of Mando? I mean, you've obviously watched the show. I've probably seen every episode upwards to six to ten times each. Holy mo! I mean, because I'm lucky while I'm too. Work, well, while I'm working on it, I'll usually, you know, you got to watch it while you're doing a concept. Right. And then I'll watch it again or I'll pause it during a sketch. And then if I'm not burnt out on it, I'll just swing back as I'm, right. you know, painting. And so that's usually what I'm working on. I like to have flavor stuff. Right. So I'm, if I'm doing a Mando painting, it's either going to be a Western or sci-fi okay. because Mandalorian is a sci-fi Western. It is. I mean, <laughs> there, there's no doubt about it. It is a from, spaghetti Western in space. Yes. From the opening thing where he walks through the door, we're like, oh, this is like walking through the door. <laughs> this is this is new. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, even the whole interaction with the Jawas in the second episode, which absolutely I mean, killed me. The Jawas just kick his ass. And you're like, oh, that that must have left the mark. I mean, and it is so good. What, it's I mean, so when, well written. It is very well written. Have you been able to sit down with Feige? Have you been able to sit down with Favreau at I don't all? Get, no, I don't get to do that cool stuff. Oh, Not yet, anyway. Not yet? No. I think you're, I'm, I'm going to bet you're close. <laughs> because if you're invited as an artist to sign, it's only a matter of time before these two, because they're such super fans. So uh, I, I know you were at our recent Denver, our Fan Expo Denver, yes. uh, two weekends ago. And um, Giancarlo Esposito was there. Yes. And he was literally one of the reasons why I had a booth, a gallery booth, where I had all my Mandalorian art. It was the first time I ever got to show it, sell it. And, and that. So Which is because I'm sure you're under an NDA and everything has to stay. When I had to become, uh, I'm the artist, but most of the artists don't become dealers. So uh, I had to... Okay become a essentially a gallery dealer for Thomas Kincaid Studios okay. as the artist, and then that allows me to be a reseller. And right now I'm just a reseller for uh, at events right. that they approve, but um, eventually I hope to be able to sell online. But at the right. moment it's just events. And so when I found out that Giancarlo Esposito was coming, I literally messaged him and was like, should I get a booth? Can I sell prints? You know, what, what, what can we do here? Right. And they accommodated and they got everything like greenlit, fast track through Lucasfilm. And so I had the booth there. And so I took I, one of the guys who was a helper. I was like, man, you, you got to go try to get me a signature on, yeah, on, absolutely. on my print from right. him. And he's like, okay, it's like 60 bucks. I'm like, here you go. You know, I expect to pay like everybody else. Take my money. So he takes it up there and then he comes back. He's like, hey, I got the signature. And, you know, he wrote 
you know, Giancarlo Esposito, Moff Gideon. All right. And then he's like, and this is the, the card of his agent who would like a copy for his house because he said he can't find any really good images of him on top of the the TIE fighter? The wrecked TIE fighter. Right. Because even when I was working from, it's he's real small. It's it's very low res. So it's not like somebody says, oh, well, you just stop it and paint from there. Most of the time, you can't see. You can't see any of the details. 40 to 60% of the details aren't there. Right. And so I'm referencing other images of his head because, believe it or not, even though my painting was 27 by 18 inches, his head is the size of my pinky fingernail. Mm -hmm. And and that's how what size I have to paint a, a oh, portrait in. Right. And try to get it accurate. And he was so pleased with it, he wants a copy. And so that was super cool, very vindicated. He <laughs> was so cool, because I mean, I, I first watched him as probably you did do the right thing. Spike Lee and mm -hmm. him opposite of Danny Aiello. And I got, I didn't get the interview that I wanted with him, but I did get to talk to him for like 20 minutes. Oh, cool. So, and the man was just so gracious and cool and just down to earth, a very humanitarian. And I asked him as we're walking did away. Did you ask him if it was cool to be a jive turkey so close to Thanksgiving? I, you know what? I almost <laughs> did. Because <laughs> I think yeah. I would have gotten the same, same response because I'm like, how do you go from this kind-hearted humanitarian to such an evil bastard as like got Moff Gideon <laughs> or Gus? And he stops where he's walking because he had come around and took pictures with us. Right. He stops and he turns and just gives me the Gus look. Wow. <laughs> he doesn't say a freaking word to me. He just gives me that and then walks back behind the table. I'm like, all right, I'm done. He's like, he's an actor. He's an actor. <laughs> End scene. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. It was just like creepy as hell. He just switched it like that. So have you contacted his agent yet? Yeah. So we're we're in talks about you know what what size and actually he lives in Albuquerque. I didn't oh, know I didn't. did not know that. No. So and and other people had mentioned that he was in things I had not seen like Breaking Bad, right? Which makes sense because they film in Albuquerque. I did not know that. I'm not giving you his address so you can stalk him. I'm not that crazy. <laughs> Yes. Okay, maybe a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Esposito, can you do an interview, please? <laughs> I just want to hang out. I just want to hang out with him and like just drink some whiskey. Right. You know, just have a good bourbon with the, the man. Those are cool stories. Like, yes. I, uh, you know, people are like, "Oh, Lou Ferrigno." I'm like, "Oh, I've had dinner with Lou several times." Yeah. A lot of times, the guest artists at a show will get to go out together. Right. And and sometimes people you know, aren't chatty at all. Nope. And other people like Liam McIntyre, who uh, played um, Spartacus mm -hmm. after the first artist, uh, actor passed away. He and we were in um, uh, Belgium all doing a show. And that was super fun. Like right. telling stories and, you know, talking amongst people. And I had drinks with Flash Gordon, Sam. You Sam. Probably, probably met Sam. I've met Sam a few times. Sam is gr Sam Neal is amazing. No, not Sam or not Neal. Sam Neal. Um, Sam. I always forget it. I always go Sam, Sam Jones. Neal. Thank you, yes. Sam Jones. Sam uh, Jones. He is hilarious. That yes. man is just on fire. I was at a, a show once, and it was this very cool uh, scenario where I, I I had checked in right behind Sulu right. and let him, no, please go in front, no. And then he goes up there, and he's like, sir, your name? And I was like, come on, man. Like, you don't know. And he's like, no, no, it's okay. Not everyone knows. <laughs> And then later on, I go to the bar, and David Carradine's playing <gasps> piano while I'm having drinks with Flash Gordon. And I'm like, this is so surreal. That this is only a very surreal at a, moment. At a pop culture convention. That is a very surreal moment. And I, I'd rather, like, with the Giancarlo Esposito story, and there's, like, a lot of other stories that I, I haven't told, but that is that is the kicker. I'd rather have those moments than them on on camera or on getting the interview. Organized, yeah. yeah. I, I, I want those those private moments, those interactions, because that is more close to entertaining than, you know, than just there, sitting there. One of our sort of a few early uh, career regrets was in 1993, we went to our very first Comic-Con, San Diego. All right. Me and I know you know uh, Gabe and Chachi Hernandez, Steve Boatney, stuff like that. Right. Uh, friends who we all did comics together well. In the very beginning, we did a comic called Lords, number one. It was supposed <laughs> to be yeah. called Lords of Light. And I know you were involved and around in the area. I was time. around there, yeah. So we pack up our van and we drive to San Diego with 3,000 comic books. 
Wow. And okay. And we're, we're pretty sure we're going to sell all of them because right. there's 30,000 people that go you're, to this you're already counting them up. Right. And they're all nerds. So we know, well, so God, we only got to sell the one out of every 10 people. It shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be that hard. And although we came back with a fair amount of comics, and I have mint ones still sitting in a box in my house, <laughs> um, my first ever publication, because I was the colorist, I airbrushed the entire book. Oh, my God. Uh, yes. Crazy. Um, was is that uh, we were out there promoting it. You know, we had our artist alley, or not artist alley, um, like small press table. Right. And so we're walking through the uh, Marriott there next door, as everybody does. Right. And, you know, we're 22-year-olds, 19-year-olds, green behind the ears. And Stan Lee is sitting at the bar by himself in the afternoon. And it was like, it almost looked like an area that maybe it wasn't even open or maybe there was a bartender there. Right. Uh, because it was like one of these kind of bars where you, you just walk by, like it's almost like right off the lobby and kind of in a real a, wide hallway. Right. Just a little like sta- uh, staging station. Exactly. Right. And, and uh, Gabe or Chachi was like, that's Stan Lee. And we're like, wow, well, okay. You know, and so we had a brief discussion with ourselves about whether we should go over. And say and hi. Introduce ourselves. Right. Say hi. And or offer to buy the man a drink and be like, you know, hey. Chachi uh, was I, the first one to run over, wasn't he? No, he's the shy one. And he was like 19 at the time. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I probably was the only one who was old enough to actually buy a drink. Um, actually, Gabe's closer to my Gabe's, age, Gabe would have been close. Yeah. Um, so we decided to not be fanboys because we thought, oh, everybody mobs him. He's take the high road. Take the high road and right. be like, you know what? It's cool. That's that's the end. We're not going to bother him. Right. But then later on, we had discussions like, well, what if he was bored? What if he wanted to, you know, talk to somebody? And, you know, he was, uh, you know, chilling. Yeah. So it would have been probably cooler to say I had a conversation with Stan Lee rather than we made a decision not no. to. Um, however, if we had gone over and he, you could tell that he really didn't want to be bothered, then I would have been like, yeah, we, we bothered Stanley. We, we annoyed Stanley. Yeah, so I can at least say I never annoyed Stanley. I they know that. <laughs> and there are those moments because you're like, you know, they, they want their, their space, but at the same time, it, it is a slippery slope. Do you, do you yeah. cross that line? I, I'd have to say, though, if I saw David Carradine playing piano at a bar, I, that is just too beautiful. I would have to go up and just and he was no he he was a hi. good he was a good piano player and he right. was known that usually whenever he's around or if there was a piano he'd play you know he'd play oh wow yep and uh, I think he passed away only like a year or two after that or oh, something so those moments funny. can't really happen anymore <laughs> no and and there was one I think it was uh, Colorado Springs Comic Con the guy that voiced Roger Rabbit he was just hanging out and just started playing piano in, oh. in the bar. That's and it was just like one of those random things that we're sitting in, and all of a sudden we hear the piano and we look over. Yeah, this guy's voice is Robert Drive. Just, 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 yeah. just stroke on the ivory. Sur- yeah, surreal moment where you're like, well, that'll never happen again. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's funny. You think that, but it does happen. Because, I mean, I, Edward James almost has been down, and I've, I've had bourbon with him oh, cool. at Denver Comic Con. And I'm sure like you where you're sitting you're at the bar with all the other hotel guests that mm-hmm. are at the con, and just all of a sudden – there's there's somebody just hanging out, mm-hmm. ready to just drink. Yeah, uh, one of my favorite shows in the whole world, probably my favorite show, is Luca Comics and Games in Luca, Italy, mm-hmm. and they get uh, paltry three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand attendees. Oh, just the paltry four hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It takes over Boy. an entire city. And again, when you get invited, uh, one year Terry Brooks, who wrote the Elf, uh, Elfstones, the Shannara series, right. which was turned into a TV series, you know, I had dinner with him because they heard that I was a big fan and read all the books when I was a kid. And I got like this close to being able to do covers for him. And oh. their, their publishing company was like, no, no, we're using photographs. I'm like, you're lame. Lame. Um, you guys but, suck. Uh, but they do a guest dinner, and um, some of the listeners may know names like Louis Royo or Michael Whalen, people who are literally legends. Right. I'm not a legend. I'm just known around Denver because I've you been here. You are a, a legend. But Come these, on. But these guys are, you know, Hugo and Nebula Award-winning artists and all that kind of thing. They're, they're like serious living legends. Right. So when I, as a, a much younger, they might look at me as a peer, but now I'm only like just 50 years old. And they're 20, 30 years ahead of me in the game. Right. Uh, it's super freaking awesome to get to sit across from these guys and just chat. And mm-hmm. you might not, you know, might not even chat about art at all. It's just right. any conversation that you'd have with anybody else. And then you're like, at the end of it, you're 
can I have my picture? You know, you hate to be the fanboy, but right, but you can't help it. You and you're like, it. I'm gonna want that picture. Yeah. Because I just reshared a picture of Louis Arroyo and I, and there were so many fans who were like, Oh my God, it's two legends in the same thing. I'm like, No, no there's there's one. Just and, one. And I'm in it <laughs> as well. I'm the fanboy. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> It's true. And that's why I love hanging out with Bob Hall, because, you know, Bob Hall comes to Denver a lot. I've ran into him in Chicago. We've hung out. Bob has such great stories. Just, and I don't want to fan over him, but, I mean, last time he was here, just last weekend, I, all we did was just sit and just bullshit about comics. And I asked him, I was like, did you ever work with Kirby? And he's all like, no, because when I was editor, Kirby was six months ahead. Okay. So he's like, I never, I never really got a chance to talk or work with Kirby. Oh, bummer. And I mean, he's like, because Kirby was just too much of a professional. I have, I have a cool story that's somewhat related to art, and I'll try to make it quick. But yeah, yeah my, we have my, no limit. My longtime mentor was an artist out of New York named Frank Cavino. Okay. And I studied under him for 15 years taking workshops on Italian Renaissance portraiture. Oh, my God. Stuff that's not even taught... Not Anywhere. Even, not even here, but not even in Italy. Right. Right? It, it takes three weeks to three months or a year to do a painting because you're literally using Renaissance techniques. Wow. And uh, But anyway, when he was a younger man, he worked for what was called the uh, Struggling Artist Studio. It was the thing where they had the ads and you sent in your art and somebody fixed it and showed you what to change. Oh, wow. But one of the founding members or the founding member, I believe, was Norman Rockwell. And so uh, he's probably 22 or 25 years old or something. And he turns around one day in his little cubicle and he's, he's you know, ch- showing somebody how to paint uh, sunflowers or something. Right. And Norman Rockwell's leaning against the, you know, the door jam, smoking his pipe, doesn't say a word. and Just watching. He, just watching. And then the next day he comes back and the same thing. And at the end of it, Frank turns around and he says, you know, I'm a huge fan. You're one of my, you know, art heroes, and I'd love to get your feedback on what I'm doing wrong here because you're really making me nervous. All right. <laughs> and he's like, "I have a gift for you. I'm gonna bring it tomorrow." And that's all he says. And then he comes back the next day, and he hands him a paintbrush that had a two to three foot handle on it. All right. Like the handle's that long. Oh you know, yeah, monstrous. Jesus. Okay. And it doesn't say a word. But Frank knew what he was saying, which is you need to get back from your work. In other words, he was right up on top of it. Uh, and a long-handled brush is you need to be farther away from what you're working painting because it's more like fine art kind of stuff, right. not illustration. And so that was his Norman Rockwell. So that, you know, Norman Rockwell wow. gave him a brush and said, you know, you're doing good work, but you need to take Here a step you back. You need to look at your work from a little farther away. See, that is, I don't know. He, he That brush is probably framed up on a wall somewhere right <laughs> God, now. I like, hope so. Boom. Yeah, where's the Norman Rockwell brush? <laughs> yes. That's what I want to see. Because, I mean, you've had your brush with greatness, and I'm, I'm encouraged. To incur, I mean, I'm excited, encouraged to see you continuing the blood and bullets mm-hmm. from your. Because I know you are a fantasy artist. I know you are. In an immense talent, but to see you come to comics finally after all of this time and do your own it, stuff. It, it's very full circle because I yes. started in 93. My first introduction was comics. I thought I would literally just be a regular illustrator, right. meaning one day you're painting bulldozers and the next day you're doing a logo or a layout for somebody's brochure right. as a graphic designer because that's what my degree was in. And so I tell people I never had lofty enough dreams for myself that I would get to work on. Dungeons and Dragons, Harry Potter, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Star Trek. You know, in some way, on some edge thing or a gaming product, I've worked for all those people. Right. And so, never been an overnight success, but I consider myself like the journeyman artist. In other words, I've been at it and everything was slow and steady, right? So I was never a Randy Queen. You're consistent, though. I'm and consistent. you and you deliver. Yeah. That's, well, you that hit, says a lot. Yeah, so you got to hit deadlines. Yes. And... and even the projects that I'm doing for The Mandalorian, every sort of contract and everything that I do usually just involves a couple pieces, meaning right. you're always earning it. They're not like, here's a contract to do 20 pieces of art. Right. Even though I've already done 12, each contract is two or three pieces. And it's not just like saying, let's how it go, but you, you know, don't drop the ball. Right. Right. And we're not going to, it's not a long term contract, but if you continue to make people happy. Then hopefully we'll they're continue like, to give you contracts. You're you're our guy. Here you and go. so what I thought was just going to start out of I get to do one or two pieces for right. the Mandalorian, 
they they basically said, well, this is this is great. What if? How would you feel if we did a painting for every episode? And I'm like, whoa, whoa. And then later on in a conversation, it came up with Lucasfilm, and they're like, okay, well, Monty's our exclusive artist. And I'm like, wow, so what is that? that yeah. So nobody else is gonna work on this, like just me. And yeah. And so for their license for Thomas Kincaid, All right, which is. You know, the, kind of the most well-known art brand of the 20th century, Correct. right? Kincaid, at one time, they said, had art in one out of ten homes in the United States. And, you know, it was a multi-million, if not billion-dollar industry back in the day, right? Cottages and picturesque and, right. you know, Disney-esque. And so to continue to work with them and to do that, and then to, as a little bit of a teaser, you're also going to start seeing... Um, classic trilogy art for me oh. as well. <laughs> and so I, I won't be able to do anything on the Book of Boba Fett. I'm a big Boba Fett yeah, right? fan myself, but they're like, I said, hey, you know, are you interested in seeing any ideas for Boba Fett? And I, I the response I'll interpret it as, hey, you're busy, so keep your eye yeah, on the just, ball. Just <laughs> don't look over here. Right? Like, you can only turn in so much art, so we're not going to split you up. Like, stay on the Mando train. I'm like, I, I'm happy on the I'm, Mando I'm train. happy on the Mando train. I'm just, I'm just kind of looking. I want to put a little egg over there. I want to put a little right. egg over there. So there, uh, I won't be working on Book of Boba Fett or Obi-Wan. Um, uh, so part of me is like, oh, that's too bad. But to get to go back and to start doing some uh, classic that would pieces. be... Those are the characters we grew up yes, with. Yes. Right? That's spectacular. So, you know, I've started proposing ideas and concepts of, of, you know, what imagery I think would be successful. And as a giant nerd myself, I always come at it from the look of a fan. Mm -hmm. Right? So, and I think that's the best approach. Yeah. Right? But you also want to be successful because they're going to hire you more. Mm -hmm. So are you going to be painting, you know, something of Jar Jar? Or you can be painting Darth Vader, Darth right? Vader. Yeah, right? all the way. This is like a no-brainer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a lie down on that one. Because, I mean, when you see, like, Feige, who is an absolute freaking, like, uber fan, and he, I mean, Mando is basically his, him and, and uh, 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 now Favreau. Right. I mean, that's their, that's their nerd. Like, okay, right. this is what we wanted to see when we were kids. And right. to see it come to such brilliant fruition. Oh, yeah. It's just like, oh. I think it blew everybody's expectations away. Oh, right out of the water. Yeah. To come to fruition is just it's so, like, oh, inspiring. And I'm just like, uh, and, and that's probably what I would do. And the final scene at the end of season two, Luke shows up. Right. Did, head explodes. Uh, my head exploded. I was yeah. screamed so loud. I was like, oh. Yeah. And, and honestly, to have an ongoing series, and I'm sure the other series will be great, too, that is as good or better let's just say better it's better, better than the the films that we got in the last 20 years so yes. the prequels obviously it's a no-brainer i thought there was some good moments and i liked seeing my classic characters back on the screen Agreed. i liked seeing han i liked seeing chewie and stuff like that you know but there's in the original movies i never you know was doing eye rolls of you know some of the stuff they were doing and you know, I thought that some characters like Finn and a few others were, you know, for the most part, just goofy. Yeah. Like, there's almost nothing Filler. ever yeah, there's serious nothing there. about it. And right. so, um, Mando, to me, is this true serial Western sci-fi that still delivers the one-liners and can make us melt with, you know, little Grogu. Right. And then, you know, we get to see lightsaber battles and... and learn about Mandalorian culture. Oh, my God. I can remember a, a funny thing that came out in the Star Wars Insider, which was the fan magazine. Mm -hmm. And this was probably 20 years ago. This was even before the prequels came right. out or somewhere in there. And they said they did a, a fan um, poll about who their absolute favorite character was. And you know who it ended up being? R2. Boba Fett. Yeah. Right? I'm not now, surprised. I see you have the R2, I uh, got the R2 uh, yeah. action figure. I still own mine as well. Um, that that's not original though. The, no. orig the original ones. This actually is a jump drive. Oh, okay, perfect. See, yeah, because my original one has paper, it had stickers on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that but one is at home right size, still. Though. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that actually, when I saw it, I was like, hey, that's kind of cool. Um, but the, uh, uh, yeah, just the way they're doing it, you just yeah, couldn't ask for something to be better. No, I mean, even when they uh, Reg Rogue One, if they had just been able to just continue oh, with like Rogue One, Rogue One yeah, that was 
uh, perfect. Yeah, Rogue One. I'm a big fan of Han Solo. Yeah, uh, I, I love both of those secondary stories. I thought they were well cast. I thought they were well acted, well written. No complaints. Own no. them, watch them, love them. Yep. Um, and you know the the recent ones. They're calling those the sequels, I guess. Um, you know, there again, there was there was. There's some great moments. There's some great moments, and there's some eye rolls. You yes. know, like, oh my gosh, they did this great thing, and and Princess Leia's gonna float off into space, and they're like, what do you mean she just opened her eyes and suddenly has you know flight powers and goes back? It's like, no, 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 you guys, you just ruined a good thing. I don't know what you just did. It was a magical moment, and it was this very sort of Christ, you know, her eyes. Yes. Her side. I was like, this is genius, and then they. <laughs> and, th and then I mean, and then you got like an e you got Poe's X-wing that drifts. Right. <laughs> it really reminded me of like Fifth Element with the cab that you know you right. hear the screeching noise of tires. It's flying. How did it screech? Right. You're like, how does that work? I don't get it. Um, is any of your art? Because I know like when the Mandalorian ends, they always have like the the painting concept mm -hmm. stuff. Is that going to be you? No, so those all come from in-house. Okay. So I believe most of those are people like uh, Ryan Church and you know others who are doing pre you know, pre viz and post viz. Right. But I can almost assure you that almost everything you're seeing there is digital artwork that's oftentimes manipulated over photographs. Right. Uh, and so um, I would say not all of them are like that. Like I, we have a piece coming out that's similar to one of the pieces that mm -hmm. you see at the end there in season season two okay episode two, episode two when they're on the ice planet right and so um that ice I, spider was so bad I, I'm, I'm you know i'm doing a take on some of the same stuff you see because right. they've already illustrated some of the pivotal moments uh but then i have to go well how can i do it different or more stylistic but, right I, the first couple of paintings I did for the series was I painted in oils, trying to maintain the uh, traditions right. of Thomas Kincaid, who painted in oils. Um, and the, the, honestly, the line was so successful that we needed to speed up production <laughs> because I wasn't being able to turn in a painting fast enough because you have dry time between layers and you can't just sign yeah, a painting you can't just and ship it. it on there, right? And then you can't ship it for another week or two because it's sticky, it's tacky, it's oil paint. And so they were like, hey, how would you feel about having enough for a calendar by a certain amount of time? Oh. And I was like, you know, if I'm going to put the foot on the gas that much, I'm going to need to speed up my production. Right. And I'm actually able to do uh, much tighter details with acrylics and pencils and markers and airbrush and all that than I can with oils. Okay. Um, so the pieces, it's, it's not just a decision on speed. Like one of the really popular pieces from episode six is called two for the road and it's right when mando hands him the little gear shift ball right and so that's one of my favorite pieces i've done fo so far and that one was done in acrylics but you can see all the little lights and everything in the entire cockpit and reflections coming up on the armor and that that's a piece, beautiful piece that thank you that piece would have been a lot more challenging because you can't just you know if you're doing a straight edge of all this stuff in the cockpit you can't just it, with a paintbrush you don't lay it against a ruler no but you can do that with other materials so it's yeah, it's stunning. and there's and there's no um, there's no digital in any of it, and so my originals look exactly like it's reproduced. And then, um, believe it or not, uh, Thomas Kincaid Studios does have the originals available online. So if somebody has fifteen to seventeen thousand that they would like to invest, I, I <laughs> trust me if they I were less dump expensive, some money into that. I, 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 I'd probably buy it back if I could afford to, but I can't afford to buy my own art. <laughs> You're Van Gogh suddenly. I, you know, I sold it for a dollar, and I can't even buy that back now. <laughs> Shit. Well, maybe, hopefully, your next Kickstarter, which we'll talk about, uh, will get you closer to that, so you can buy some of its back. Cause oh, I'm, I, if I really want I to, know I could buy to. one back, but I just have a hard time because I can draw more. I'm like, yeah, I mean, you, you created it. Buy all it. you want. I'm going to make more. Yes, please. <laughs> Oh, no, you bought it. I got to make more. Oh, no. Because <laughs> you're doing another installment of Blood and Bullets. Yep. Which I, is a brilliant idea. I don't know why you waited so long. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I just had too much free time. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, Rona. So you're, you're doing the second installment, and uh, same 48-page mm -hmm. 
Yep, and it wraps up the first story arc, which okay. is a 100-page uh, screenplay. Okay. Uh, what was the best part of putting this story together? I mean, was there one where you're, like, laying it out and you just, like, had to stop for a moment and go, okay, this is really freaking good? Uh, no. I don't. I only get those moments when I'm doing cover art okay. because I hire artists. So my artist, in true spaghetti western fashion, is Italian. Nice. Even better. <laughs> and the colorist is in Colorado. So we have an Italian and we have people from the Rockies. I like it. That's uh, quite the mishmash. Yes. My letterer is in Australia. So it's a, we're internationally known about the microphone. Guys. Nice. <laughs> I like it. Um, so, you know, I see the pages come in. Uh, 99.9 .9 of everything that's turned in, I do not change, adjust, or anything. If I'm happy with it... You just let it ride? I let it ride because uh, i that's what I would want from when, when I'm an artist. I don't right. want somebody to noodle with it. And no matter what, it's not going to look like how I would do it. And so uh, I've, I've become comfortable with just saying, this is the look and this is the style. And if I look at the page and it meets the goal and it's quality visual storytelling, right? as long as it looks good there and I can follow the story, I know that when the text is added, it's going to take It'll it to the next level. Right. Um, and right now I have eight graphic novels in process from mature readers, over-the-top occult horror that's Ooh. like Clive Barker. Right. Um, that's called The Book of Mark. Uh, then I also have an anthology that we're going to release next year that is, uh, will probably be somewhere in the 60 page range. Right. And each of the stories is almost a full comic, like 18 to 20 pages. Holy crap. And there's a Halloween story, a Bigfoot story, and a sci fi story. Wow. So, with the flavor of that one, which is called The Midnight Cafe, it's, uh, it's my take on Strange Tales, uh, Amazing Stories, Twilight Zone. Oh, amazing Stories. Yeah. We should probably, I mean, you weren't involved with it this year because I think you were actually out of town, but the Colorado Festival of Horror, we really should have you. Oh, that would be cool. As a, as a guest. When does that take place? Um, we can officially say uh, September 9th, 10th, and 11th of next year. This oh. year it was uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th, uh, you know, the shift. But oh. it's that same second weekend in September here in, in It'd Colorado. It would be a good time for me because I do an art residency down in Arizona for oh, perfect. Uh, almost three months. Right. And that's April through March. And that's when I'm – I'm in a – my booth is a, like a three-booth space, and you paint live every day for oh, wow. 75 days. And so I have only Western and wildlife art down there. But this year – I'm bringing Star Wars. Yes. <laughs> I like it. As well. So it's going to be stagecoaches and spaceships. I like you know, that. In my booth. So <laughs> it's a match. Is that a Winnebago? <laughs> no, it's a stagecoach. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so when do you kick off the Kickstarter? And what's the, I mean, do you, can you give us anything on Blood and Bullets too? Or what, what, what do you, what do you, what can you, what can you tell us? Um... Hmm. That's a little tricky. I mean, it, it is one story arc that's Kay. cut in half. Right. So if you were watching a, a, a full movie, it's going to be the second half of the movie where, Kay. you know, things are going to get worse for the heroes and yes. things are going to look good for the villains. Uh, but I will say there's two really good uh, reveals, things that I don't think people will see coming. Oh, even better. I and, like that. And people enjoyed that about Loco Hero and some of the other things that I've done as well. And so... Uh, hopefully that's enjoyable, right? And it's not just a static, like, well, we know where this is going. Right. You know, it's gunfire, gunfights and vampire bites in the Old West. It is that. We know who the good guys are. And we know who the heroes are. You think. You think. I like that. Um, a little, and so, little rub. I love it. Right. And, you know, they're strong characters. They're sexy. I had written a different screenplay called Dead by Sundown mm -hmm. that was also a vampire western. And the producer that was interested in optioning the, uh, something in this genre is a female producer and said, I love this story, I love this originality, but you don't have any strong female characters in Dead by Sundown. Okay. It was a, all male leads, and there was a female love interest. Okay. And I said, well, what if I wrote you an entirely new vampire western themed story, and all the main characters, the three strongest characters, were women? She's like, oh, I'd love to see that. Nobody's seen that. Nobody's seen that, no. Uh, and so I have, you know, my gunslinger character of Mary Masterson, and I have uh, my Native American character, Blackbird, who had married Mary's brother, and neither her tribe nor the people in the town want her there. Right. Right? Because this is a culture clash. So right. there is some cultural issues that, you know, are very, very, very typical of the time, very typical of the time and, and typical of things we struggle with today. Yes. So there's still 
you know, stories in there that you're not going to just uh, see in like, sort of a typical, like, non-deep right. kind of thing. And even Mary at the very beginning, she's like, I'm going to go off. And when the, when the brother gets killed in the first issue, you know, she's on a revenge mission. And here comes Blackbird. And she's like, yeah, you need to take care of the kids here. And, you know, I'm going to go off and do this thing. Wow. And they, they are not friends. It's not just like, well, let's unite and do this together. And when she realizes that Blackbird is very capable and real handy with knives, suddenly like, hey, okay, you got my back. Let's do this together because we're up against what they don't know in the beginning is they think they're just, you know, on a typical revenge right. thing. And in this story, I will say vampires never mentioned once because there is no label for it. Right. They don't, it don't exist. They, they don't, it doesn't exist. Right. Uh, and so there will be sort of more reveals in this story. Sweet. And how does people who don't necessarily know how to fight vampires, how do you kill one that they've been killing people for centuries? Yeah. How do you learn how to kill it? <laughs> It's an apex predator for a reason. Right. And, you know, it's easy for us to say in pop culture, we're like, well, we know well, about silver. Yeah, and, duh. And, you know, things like that. And, and Pick up a book. <laughs> <laughs> so when do you start the Kickstarter for the second installment? Uh, this Wednesday we'll kick it off. We usually do kind of an after work thing so that people can be home and in front of their computers. Okay. For those that are actually going to an office these days. Right. Um, and... Uh, Typically, Wednesday is, is historically the best day for Kickstarters because then you can roll right into the weekend with, right. some, with some good steam. And so uh, we are uh, just about every day I'm actually getting in cover art that's kind of coming in like l typically like late last minute. Right. Uh, and then I was already I was doing some drawing this week. I drew a new cover for what we call the Heroes Edition. Right. And on all of my Kickstarters, I do a philanthropy level tier where all that money goes to a charity of, of that I choose. Nice. So, you know, if it's local hero, it might be going to veterans. Uh, some of my previous ones went to Native American right. Heritage Foundation. And so this one's going to an organization in Montana called Heroes and Horses. And they work with veterans, with equine therapy, with horses. Nice. And so it kind of brings the two Everything together. together. Yep. Yeah, nice. And so the proceeds, anybody who backs that tier... The, the profits from that particular pledge go directly to charity. Very cool. So we're getting close to the end. I know you, you hate to go. <laughs> but how do the fans at home and the millions listening around the world stalk you? How do they follow the great Monty? I'm pretty the easy great, to follow. The great <laughs> Monty. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm very active on uh, Facebook. So my personal page is Monty Michael Moore. Uh, I have an artist page. If you don't want to, you know, reach out and do the whole friend thing, you can just follow the artist page, Monty M. Moore. Then Blood and Bullets has its own Facebook page with like 1,700 followers. Nice. Um, and you can, of course, go to Kickstarter and search Blood and Bullets. And the short link for uh, to go directly to pre-sign up for the Kickstarter is inked.pub slash bnb2 brilliant so that's a nice little shorty one and then um, my website's called maverick arts or mav arts for short you can go to either one of those two online for our comic book store All right and i'm mav arts uh on instagram and mav arts monty on twitter i'm not a big twitter guy because i prefer a visual yeah medium i'm right. not even a big instagrammer but i still post and share at least Instagram makes sense to me. Twitter, I don't even get anymore. Uh, yeah, I did a couple of videos on TikTok where I was uh, showing like how to airbrush a frame and building right. stuff, and I was like, I don't think this is my crowd. No. And so I, I usually don't post anything there. Um, Agreed. Uh, so pretty easy to find in that respect. I do have a YouTube channel where I haven't posted regularly in a while, right. but I have. I think there's 40 or 50 videos that are how tos. I even have one on called How to Break Into the Comics Business, where I give suggestions and what worked for me. Right. And here's what you should do if you're an artist today. If like you're considering. How do you, yeah, how do you get exposure? How do you take those steps from going from amateur to pro? And so there's some videos on there. So if you look up uh, Monty Moore's Art Attack, this Art Attack is the name of the... <laughs> the, the oh my the God, channel. you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> I am a funny dude. Uh, 
that uh, you can you can check out videos for there and free, and you can laugh at me because sometimes I do goofy things where I, you know, guest airbrush and I'll use like a different stupid voice, you know, like I'm Snurdly Snodgrass or something <laughs> like that, <laughs> just to entertain oh myself. Oh my I'm doing god! <laughs> Are you doing any of your Grinch? I'm surprised you haven't done any of your art in your Grinch suit. Uh, I have an idea to do a piece of art in my Grinch suit, but I haven't done it. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag okay. for what it is. But he, I do love, you know. Your I'm Grinch enough, is spot on, I, by the way. I'm old enough that we call it dressing up. We didn't call it cosplay. Now yes. it has a title. But, uh, y yes, I've done a number of things from my Colonel Sanders and Grinch so to hilarious. full-on Beetlejuice with, you know, I airbrush and do all my own makeup. Forgot about um, that one. The uh, so there's a number of things out there, and uh, last year was it two years ago? Two years ago at Christmas, I was actually doing the Cowboy Christmas uh, show in Las Vegas, which is a big Western thing, part of the national uh, the NFR, and I was paid to fly back to Denver to go to a, uh, a Christmas appreciation party from a real estate group in Boulder, and they paid me a quite handsome appearance fee to be Grinch at their party. And I was like, I can't do your party because I'm out of town. Right. And they were like, well, could you just come back for the night if we flew you in? Right. I was like, okay. oh, well, what the hell? Like that, you know. Wow. And so I, I have been paid to be the Grinch before, which is great because it's I, just will, great. I will tell you that the reason why it's awesome to be the Grinch is you get to mess with everybody. Like and that it's is acceptable. literally your job. That is. Is just to heckle everybody. And you know, scare people. And there's people who have like a fear of the Grinch. They, they're, there is. They're the best. You scared. <laughs> I remember we were in a Christmas uh, parade together, uh, which I don't know why they want the Ghostbusters in a Christmas parade, but that was beside the point. Monty shows up in his Grinch outfit and I laugh my ass off. And you scared the shit out of this kid so bad. <laughs> it was awesome. Was that, the, was that the year I was Grinch or the year I was March Hare? I think. Was that the one in Golden? That was the one in Golden. Oh, yeah. 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 The good news is when it's cold out, that costume is nice yeah, and warm because it's gold. fuzzy. Gold. <laughs> yeah. That thing's oh, that gold. Year, there's a Jim Carrey. I didn't know that he actually, so he said, yeah, you know, that, that's the Grinch. And then he'd say, hello. <laughs> and I didn't know what he makes the face. Right. Like, oh, yeah. The yeah, his face is rubber. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whereas I put rubber on my face. It's gooey. But I was, I was hanging out with Brian that day because he was Groot. He and was. Groot had a hard time walking and seeing, so I would basically be this whirling dervish around him, and he would, you know, we we sort of brought up the rear of the, the of parade. our group of the parade. Yeah, <laughs> poor Brian, he can't see out of that. It's a beautiful cosplay oh, of Groot, and he's, and he's up already, tall. He's already tall. And yeah, I mean, I feel so bad for him when he's in that thing. Captain Colorado was doing laps around us on the motorcycle, <laughs> and I was so close to just jumping on the back you and sitting have. and riding. And I was like, this could go poorly. Maybe, you know, me. he's not <laughs> so, that he's not that good of a motorcyclist. I think he would have wiped him out. I've seen him not what, do I well. I was worried that we might have a disaster. Yeah. I was like, this is going to be great. And I'm like, hold the roll. Yeah. So. He's not that. He's not that. But it was, yet. I mean, we, I hung around for another hour or two just taking pictures yeah. of people. That was, that was super fun. It is a good time. Unfortunately, now for me doing the Western show at Cowboy Christmas is literally the first two weeks right. of of. of and Golden. so I missed the Santa run and Brack, which is when oh, I started doing the Grinch. Right. And then, uh, I, you know, I can't do a lot of other events because they're like, oh, you've got to come up and do that. And I'm like, I'm in Vegas of all places. Right. Yeah. Of all <laughs> Last year it was Dallas-Fort Worth for, you know, 10 days during the height of COVID, which was crazy. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully things will be a little bit more relaxed and safe and vaccinations and all that. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess that kind of wraps our time, bud. You gotta go. Awesome. Well, we I mean we, we we're we're keeping people I mean we're well into an hour, almost an hour and a half now. And I know we could go for I always got that check mark that said talks too much in class, so I Oh yeah, I'm I got pretty it all the time. easy to interview. Yeah, I got it all the time. <laughs> You're just fountain in it for me. I don't even have to like I could just sit here and just listen to you talk. We're um, just two dudes chatting with a microphone. Pretty much. <laughs> two white boys in a microphone. Yeah. Um <laughs> Hey, 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 there we go. Um, I have won a few co dance contests in my day as well. Let's see, let's I will tell you. Let's see, let's see. Where's your uh, next appearance? Is it the Cowboy Christmas? It's Cowboy Christmas. Then I'll be down in Arizona. So the two pop culture conventions that I, I was fortunate to do and both were wildly successful was New York. All right. Uh, did the New York Con and then and Denver. So I don't have any um, pop culture events because it's a busy time of year for my Western stuff. Yeah. So we'll be back in the spring. Well, I'm sure we'll head back to uh, 
you know, a lot of the usual things. We'll go back to San Diego finally. San Diego finally. So renewed my booth there. Um, got a couple year reprieve and didn't have to go, you know, manage my booth. Which is I nice. had gone 28 years in a row. Jesus. Um, and so some of the newness and shininess was a little worn off for me. Yeah. Um, Not as it, shiny. And it's super, super expensive. And there's great shows everywhere. There are. Um, so I, I will be represented. Josh, uh, who helps manage the studio, is going to be at Phoenix Fan Fusion. Okay. And the reason why I won't be there is I will be at Celebration um, promoting the Mandalorian series. You can't, Thomas you can't, Day. yeah, Celebration way better. <laughs> I'm just saying. That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. All right, Monty, yeah. I will let you out of here. Thank you so much for sitting in on this and uh, reaching out to the people. Check out his Kickstarter. Starts Wednesday. We'll have a link on the page and on this podcast post and on the YouTube channel. So check that out. And remember... Expect more. Expect more. But in the meantime, run fast, laugh hard, and always be kind. Good night!